So this is my first time at SANS, and I'm really excited to be here. I have to admit, I'm a little bit intimidated uh, by this crowd. Um, that doesn't happen to me too often. And, and of course, I have to follow the most interesting man in information security, which is awesome. I got to fire my agent when I, uh, when I get back. Anyway, I, I spend my time, I, I do a fair amount of speaking. I'll talk about what my day job is in, in a minute. But I do a fair amount of speaking. I speak at two types of conferences. I speak at legal conferences, where I try to help lawyers understand technology risk and how you know, legal decisions can have an impact on, on technology and how cybersecurity, how lawyers need to be involved in assessing cybersecurity risk. And then I speak at technical conferences like this one, and yes, try to help uh, technologists and cybersecurity professionals from breaking the law, um, which actually can be complicated uh, from time to time. But really, more often, and that's, this is really my, my objective today, is to get you to think about um, how the decisions that you make um, can potentially create legal liability that, that you weren't otherwise aware of. So that's really what, what I'm going to talk about uh, here today. Um, you know, the other thing I'll point out before I get going here is, uh, you know, because I do these two different kinds of presentations, has, has anyone ever, first of all, are there any lawyers in the room? All right, good, good, good. Um, so if anyone's, you, so you probably have not been to a legal conference um, or seen people who ordinarily speak at these legal conferences, but lawyers love to receive input in text form. So it's slide after slide of dense bullet points. And obviously technologists do not like that. They like cartoons. You know, again, great that I get to follow the guy who created his own cartoon for his presentation. So a lot of times I find myself in between. In fact, when I first sent my deck to Rebecca, who, who helped me, she bounced it back immediately. She was like, too many bullets. You know, what the heck is it? This crowd isn't going to go for that. So I tried to find this middle ground. I, I did put some pictures in, um, but, but go a little bit easy on me uh, in that regard. So another point I want to make before I jump in is that a lot of times, or most of the time when I get up and speak, I am very, very confident in the veracity of, uh, and, 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 and you know, sort of the, the strength of the position that I'm about to take uh, in giving my talk. This is not one of those situations. Um, I actually think I may not be 100% correct in the fears that I have around information sharing. Um, so I, I the ideal outcome of this talk is that yes, I make you guys a little bit more wary about sharing uh, and more aware of the risk, but I also hoping, you know, and I'll try to get to the Q&A so we have some time to get into this discussion, I hope you can make me feel a little more comfortable with it um, because I think I may have taken it too far in, in, in my concerns. But the point is there's a lot of uncertainty in this area and I really want everyone here to, to think about the potential consequences of engaging in, in sharing threat intelligence. So, this is really, um, th this talk is, is, is an expansion of sort of a cocktail party rant that I developed uh, uh, probably over a year ago, um, you know, when I used to talk about how people are sharing willy-nilly and there's this pressure coming from the government uh, to share when really it's, it's, it's the government just trying to get us to, uh, to provide them with indicators. There's really not that much of an intent to, to share back to us. Uh, so I've tried to expand that uh, into, into this talk. So let me talk about um, a little bit more about my, my background here. Um, so my background, I, I am an attorney. Um, I serve as the chief privacy officer for my company, United Lex. Uh, so that's the quasi-legal role that, that I have. Uh, and then I also run the company's cyber risk solutions practice. And so the, the bulk of my career since I left officially the practice of law back in 2002 has been working at the intersection of law and technology. So I started my career as a litigator. Um, I, I got into the area of privacy law. Again, spent a lot of my time uh, working in the cybersecurity field, running uh, uh, forensics practices um, for the better part of the last 15 years, and really, you know, have had a, a front row seat to you know dozens and dozens of incidents and breaches. Uh, that, that have occurred over the years, and which has made me a world-class paranoiac. Um, and you know, what I, when people ask me, well, how did you make the transition from being a lawyer into the field of cybersecurity, information security? Um, I, I always point out it's really not that far of a leap when you think about, you know, so the fundamentals of what 
what a lawyer does and what an information security professional does, we all are paid to assume that calamity is right around the corner, right? That you're gonna, you're gonna step into the street and get hit by a bus. And okay, what do we need to do to prevent that from happening? So the mindset is actually very similar. We just have to learn new, te new, new terminology uh, to, to a large extent. So, um, you know, and, and also like lawyers, uh, information security professionals tend to be there. They have front row seats when, you know, the stuff hits the fan and you sort of learn from this negative reinforcement, uh, which is a, to a large extent the same thing that happens uh, with lawyers. Uh, you know, I think another thing that you need to know about me uh, in, in where I'm coming from on this is I actually am not much of a sharer. Um, uh, I am not on Facebook. Not only am I not on Facebook, I have trouble understanding why anyone is on Facebook. Um, and, I, and, I, and I'm not not on Facebook because I'm worried that I'm gonna share something that I don't wanna share, I have complete control over that. You know why I'm not on Facebook? Because I don't wanna know what the rest of you have to wanna share with me. All right, so I, I just don't understand this compulsion to share. So I think that colors my, my attitude on this topic uh, as well. So um, I'm here to talk about sharing. Um, you know, sharing, I, I will point out at the outset here, does not come naturally to human beings, right? We, when we're kids, we have to be taught to share. Uh, I, I know with my own kids, it's some of the first lessons you, you teach them, how it's important to share and it's nice to share. And I, and I certainly can see there are many, many benefits to sharing in, in the world. It allows us to you know, form a relatively functional society. We can build alliances. We can build trust with people through sharing. So I, I, I totally get that. Um, but I think we do need to keep in mind that there could be a reason, an evolutionary reason, why it doesn't come naturally to us, right? So we should be wary, we should be careful about the circumstances in which we share. So sharing is most effective, in my opinion, when, especially when we're talking about intelligence, when, you're sh when, when the two parties sharing intelligence have relatively equal ability to act on that intelligence, right? So if you, if you look at uh, two nation states sharing threat intelligence or look at the five eyes, right? The reason that that is, is, is effective for the most part is that you know that when you share a piece of intelligence with that other party, um, they're gonna be able to make some use of it, they're gonna understand what it is, they're gonna be able to analyze it, they're gonna be able to put it in the proper context for themselves uh, and, and, and act on it. When you get a situation where, you, where the parties sharing intelligence with each other are not, do not have equal capability to act on that intelligence, you can get some weird things happening. Um, number one, you can just have sort of ineffective sharing that one of the parties who's receiving threat intelligence doesn't really know what to do with it. They don't really understand what it is. They need help with the context. Um, but, you know, the, it, and, and the other thing is that the, the parties who have the greater capability tend to benefit the most from that threat sharing. Um, so I would, I, I'm, I'm not going to talk, it's, it's hard to do this talk without talking at all about um, about CISA or CISA, I'm not sure how to, how to pronounce it, the Cybersecurity Information Sharing Act. Everyone's familiar with this act, I assume, in this room. I, 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 if not, we can, I can talk to you afterwards. How many of you participate in information sharing um, under CISA, either through an ISAC or directly in the AIS? Okay, that's actually a smaller percentage than, than I thought uh, of, of this crowd. How many of you participate in other more informal sharing with other organizations? Okay, so I think between those two, we're talking about the, the majority of the people engage in some sort of uh, information, uh, information sharing. So I, I wanna, what, what I wanna focus on today um, is the ways that you can actually be punished for sharing information, uh, that this information can be used against you. Um, so there are three primary areas where you can get in trouble. One, you can share too much information and or share that information too broadly with too wide of a group. Uh, number two, you can fail to act on information that is shared with you. And number three, um, in devoting time and resources to information sharing, you can neglect uh, to pay attention to sec security priorities um, you know, that frankly may be more effective if you put more time into them. So I would, my, I would suggest that those three areas can create legal risk for your organization, right? So um, I, I assume most of you are, are familiar with the concept of negligence, the legal concept of negligence, right? That 
you failed to do what a reasonable person, a reasonable company, given the same set of facts and the same situation would have done. If you fail to meet that standard of sort of the, the reasonable person, then you can be held liable for your failure. And so that's what a lot of civil litigation is based on, and frankly, what a lot of regulatory actions are based on as well in this area is you know, this question of, did you act appropriately? Did you fail to meet this, this standard? Um, and I think information sharing, for these three reasons, you can get into trouble and create liability. So um, bottom line up front here, uh, and then I'll get into some, a, couple, a couple of, uh, of, of examples and scenarios. Um, so threat intelligence sharing can be very beneficial, so I don't want to come off as someone who's against sharing altogether, uh, but you've got to think before you share. You may be inadvertently creating liability and risks, so you've got to think about how at each time you share, how uh, that could be happening. Um, second, you've got to have a plan for how you intend to consume and orchestrate threat intelligence that you're receive, receiving. So there's a risk in sharing, uh, which is, tends to be more obvious. But there's also a risk just in consuming and receiving. I know I've talked to a lot of companies that are participating in an ISAC or, or one of these sort of um, you know, industry-based information sharing communities, and they say, oh, no risk for me. I'm only consuming. I'm not sharing anything outbound. What I'm going to talk about today, but that doesn't necessarily eliminate your risk. You've got to understand. You've got to have a plan in place that allows you to orchestrate a response to that intelligence. And then finally, this is obvious to most of you who are in this profession: uh, the most valuable threat intelligence originates from your environment, and frankly, stays there. You don't need to share it for it to be valuable uh, to you. And frankly, a lot of the intelligence uh, may only be valuable to you. Um, so, what is CISA? I, 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 only I'm going to spend a minute on this, uh, the Cybersecurity Information Sharing Act. Um, uh, either the key to combating hackers or a dire threat to Americans' privacy. It just depends on who you ask. I would have uh, one more possibility here that it just, could just be a colossal waste of time and resources. Time will tell. Uh, uh, I, I certainly have my doubts. So what does CISA do real quickly? Uh, the first piece of cybersecurity legislation that Congress is able to actually pass uh, in this sort of new age of ever-present cyber threats to, to all of us, uh, creates a sort of voluntary, quote-unquote voluntary, peer pressure-based system. Uh, you know, I always get a, I get a little uh, hot under the collar when I hear some of the, the, the government representatives talk about uh, information sharing and sort of appealing to our patriotic duty and, and stuff like that without talking about some of the, some of the risks uh, in, in these programs. Um, one of the reasons it took so long to, to enact uh, CISA is uh, that uh, corporations were not comfortable sharing information without having some level of liability protection. So CISA has that um, to a point. Uh, and, and I won't get into too much detail on this now. I'm happy to talk about it afterwards. But in order to receive the benefit of this liability protection, you have to share information according to the, the dictates and requirements of CISA. So one of those requirements is you must eliminate all personally identifiable information, PII, from the information that you're sharing. The entire burden for doing that is on you. And if you fail to do that, you, you get no liability protection under CISA. Right? CISA also protects the information that you share from being used as the basis for an enforcement action by a government, state, local regulator. So it does sort of usurp any, any other state laws that might, might, um, might be inconsistent with CISA, CISA controls. And so CISA says this information cannot be used as the basis for an enforcement action. Now, the reason I'm emphasizing as the basis for an enforcement action is it is not at all clear. And when something is not clear, uh, you know, we as lawyers assume the worst, right? Assume that it will be interpreted in the light least favorable to you. So it cannot be used as the basis for an enforcement action, but could it be used if, there, if an enforcement action were initiated uh, because of some other piece of evidence or some other driver, could that information be used as a piece of an enforcement action? I'm not convinced that that couldn't be done. Right? So think about the fact that the information you share, what I, what I would suggest to you is you've got to assume that the information you share uh, under CISA or with one of these ISACs or really with anybody can and will be used against you. Think Miranda writes here, right? Now, there are a lot of situations where you, you can ask yourself that question and still be comfortable sharing. There are other situations, and we'll talk about this, uh, where, you, where you might not be comfortable. 
Um, so, so that's really what CISA does. Um, you know, I, I like to I like to sort of boil it boil it down into into layman's terms. Give me your threat intel. You know, only if you feel like it, um, and we'll totally protect it. And we probably won't share it with other agencies, although they say that they will share it if it, if it will help them prosecute uh, a crime, anti-terrorism, these kinds of things. Um, and if there's stuff in there that makes you look bad, we're not going to use against it. We're not going to use it against you. Probably, um, but someone else might, right? This could this is information that could be used against you. Does not certainly doesn't prevent you from being pursued or have this information used against you by a regulator outside the United States or by civil litigants. So, what is what, what does CISA not do? It does not protect you from liability for, uh, uh, if you fail to share intelligence the right way. It does not protect you in the event of a data breach. And we're going to talk more about that. Um, and it does not protect you against legal action outside the, the, the US. Um, so it cannot protect you against civil legal action. So the information that you share is protected from a FOIA request. So I can't launch a phishing expedition and say, hey, I want to see all the threat intelligence that company A has shared through their ISAC or, or, or un under CISA and use that as a way to try to come up with a way to sue them uh, for some sort of negligence. But um, if I know uh, that the, a company that has had a breach participates in information sharing. Now, I'm going to show you an example of a, uh, a document request uh, that, that was served uh, a few years ago in, uh, in an enforcement action. Um, and you'll see the kinds of questions that are asked. One of the questions that I would certainly ask if I were uh, a, civil, a, a plaintiff suing a company post data breaches, hey, what information sharing programs do you participate in? And not only that, what information, I want to see all of the information that you shared with this organization um, over the last five years. Right now, so that information may be protected in that the government isn't going to share it, but you still have a record of the information that you shared that you would have to turn over in, uh, in, in a litigation. Um, so uh, again, the various torts, as we talk about them in, in the legal sense, not these delicious torts um, that, I'm, that I'm presenting here, um, really are based on this, again, reasonableness standard. Can I establish that this company was negligent in the way it, in the way it responded to a particular incident or indicator? Right? That is what the plaintiff's bar out there, all the lawyers out there that are, that are suing. And you probably notice, you know, any significant data breach today is followed by a raft of lawsuits. There's a lot of plaintiffs, a lot of very smart, talented, creative plaintiffs lawyers, painful as it is for me to say those words, um, that are coming up with all kinds of ways to come after companies and make them look bad um, and either extract a, a, a sort of ransom settlement out of them um, or actually um, you know, prove in a court of law that, that they were negligent. Um, so there's also no protection for intelligence that you share more casually. And I, I've seen this happen a lot. Uh, you know, I, I've done a lot of data breach work over the years, as I mentioned. And one of the things we very often see when we come in and we're talking to the information security team is that sometime early on, after the incident was detected internally, but before they knew it was a breach, you know, we try to avoid using that word until we know that there's been some kind of uh, e exposure. Um, so early on, when all they've got is something weird, a system acting funny, a strange looking file showing up. Um, that there's a lot of informal information sharing going on, right? So you have your two or three people that you really trust. Um, and it can be a lonely job, especially if you've got a small team or if you're by yourself in your organization. Um, it can be a lonely feeling. You're constantly worried about missing something. So there's probably, you probably have a group of people that you trust and you reach out to. We see that a lot in incident response that there's, you know, usually what, what, what we'll see is maybe just an email saying, hey, Bob, you got time to talk. I saw something weird today. Right? And you don't know what that conversation was, so you go and talk to the, say, hey, what did, what did you and Bob talk about there? Uh, and what would Bob say if Bob were asked what you guys talked about that day? So you really need to be careful. Uh, it's not the main point of my talk today, but think about casual information sharing as a situation that can create risk uh, just as much as this more formal information sharing uh, can do. So you really need to recalibrate you know, your risk meter and rethink your assumptions about sharing. Um, you know, a lot of people would take these statements for granted. It can't hurt if we just receive threat intelligence, right? Well, I already talked about how it actually can hurt. Uh, better to know about a threat than not know. 
We're certainly well past the head in the sand days. I, I, I get that. But again, if you are aware of a potential threat and you fail to act, you could definitely be in a worse position from a liability perspective than if you hadn't known at all. So you've really got to make sure that you're in a position to orchestrate these responses. I can't possibly stay on top of emerging threats alone. I need help and collaboration. Um, that can certainly be true um, for, for most people. It is a good idea to seek a second opinion from a trusted friend when I find something that, that I think might be bad, right? Just to confirm, before I raise the alarm bell, I want to make sure. Um, you've really got to be careful uh, because all of those things I just talked about are, this is, I think, the one, one other legal term that I'm going to introduce today. How many are familiar with the term discoverable in a legal context? OK, I won't ask why you're familiar with that term, but it probably was not a pleasant experience. What does it mean? What does discoverable mean? The opposition can request it and is entitled to receive a copy of it um, in a litigation. If they file a case against you, you can serve a discovery request. Um, and, uh, and anything that is relevant to the, the claim um, must be produced by the party who receives this discovery request, unless it's protected by attorney-client privilege and there's some other sort of exemptions there. Um, but everything that I just showed on the last slide, um, you know, all these things, this is discoverable information, uh, right? So, th so the information that you receive through your ISAC or through any, any information sharing mechanism is potentially discoverable information that can be used against you. Um, so let's talk about how that plays out. So what every regulator, in my experience, what every regulator or plaintiff wants to know after a breach has occurred um, you know, is, is the same set of stuff, right? Obviously, there's different ways that you ask for it, and, and the answers are, are highly varied. But they all want to know, how did it happen? How did the breach happen? Uh, when did you know about the breach? At what time did you first know that you had an issue. And, and as we all know, anybody who's done incident response work knows that that is a very difficult question to answer. When did I know what? Right? When did I know there was actual, actually exfiltration of information? I can give you that date. But when did I know that there might be something funny going on in my environment? <laughs> I've known, I, I, I feel that way almost every day. So how do you trace that back? Um, how did you respond uh, to this information when you got it? What was exposed, and how do you know what was exposed? That's one of the most contentious issues that comes up um, when, you, when you're working with a regulator uh, post-breach or, or you're being sued by a plaintiff is, you know, they will ask you, well, what was exposed? It was, you know, personal information. That's, that's why you see these companies having to do iterative disclosures. You know, well, it was only 100,000 usernames and passwords, but the passwords were, you know, salted and encrypted, whatever. Uh, and then eh, a couple weeks later, actually, it was 500,000 usernames and passwords, and you know, 300,000 of them actually weren't salted and encrypted. Right? And you get this trickle effect. It is very difficult in, in, in you know, determining, determining that you were exposed in the first place, that you had a breach, can be challenging. A lot of times, it's pretty easy to determine, yeah, we had an issue. We were owned. Somebody had access to, to these servers for a period of time. But determining what they actually did on those servers and what information they actually compromised is a very difficult question. Were you on notice of the risk and what measures were in place to prevent the breach? This is where the information sharing starts to get, um, uh, starts to get a little scary, right? Were you on notice? Well, what does that mean? Um, does it mean that there was uh, you know, a threat feed, whether it was an email from a friend or, or a bulletin from an ISAC sitting unread in my, in my box? Uh, I just never got to it, or, or I had this indicator, but I fat-fingered putting it into, my, uh, in, into one of my security devices, and, and we missed it. Um, when were we on notice? This is something that gets argued a lot in these data breach uh, 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 litigations. Um, and then what people, process, and technology failures contributed to the breach? These are the things that regulators want to know. These are the things that plaintiffs want to know. These are the things that you need to think about, um, you know, frankly, long before there's any sort of breach, but whenever you're dealing with information and, and certainly sharing any information. Now, I've taken an excerpt from, this is a, an actual document request that was served by the Federal Trade Commission on LabMD. Anybody familiar with this LabMD case? It's a, it's a really interesting uh, case study. Uh, I, I don't have time to get into it, but if you're, it, it's, look it up. 
Look up LabMD if you're interested in sort of how the government handles these breach investigations. So I'm going to point you to uh, uh, request number six here. So the, this is the Federal Trade Commission serving document requests looking for all communications, all communications between or among the company LabMD or any third party, right? So any communications, no matter who is a part of these conversations, about any security incident at any point in time. Okay, that is standard fare today. You will see that in any every document request that is served today by a, by a regulator or a private litigant. And chances are, a court's going to say, yeah, that makes sense. It's relevant to the claim. Um, and you need to provide this information. That is all discoverable information. And number seven is pretty scary, too. All forensic reports or analyses relating to any security incident. Um, some very sensitive information that, that can be turned over. And, and a lot of the people in this, in this room are involved in creating whatever gets turned over in response to those requests. So you've got to think about that. You know, am I comfortable having this, ex everything that I create, all these communications that I have about threats shared? Okay, so I'm going to go through a scenario uh, and, and, and then uh, uh, wrap it up here and take, and take some questions. So just to make this a little, a little bit more real. Okay, so your crack information security team notices unusual communication from a host in your environment, communicating out to, a, to an unknown IP, not blacklisted, uh, but unknown, an unusual time of day, something that sticks out, right? Something fairly obvious, hey, we should go check out what the heck this was. You, you investigate, you find what appears to be an exfiltration folder um, uh, on this host. You also find uh, some malware uh, on that host. Um, you act decisively and quickly. Your team is at its best. It isolates the host. Um, it prevents any exfiltration. It's the exfiltration folder is there, but you can conclusively show, because of the log data, that nothing went back out. Um, you prevented any propagation. You scan across your network. You've contained um, the, the incident. You eradicate the malware. Um, it's a good day uh, for the team. There's only one host uh, affected. Um, you're feeling good, right? Uh, go out and have a beer. And hey, why not? We'll, we'll help our friends, right, the, who might have experienced the same thing. You share these indicators through your, your ISO, your information sharing and analysis uh, organization that, that you participate in. OK, so let's carry this through into scenario two. So you've, you're, the ones who, you're the one who created these indicators. You've shared them with your ISAL. You now need to make sure that you're consuming them properly and that you're, you're making sure that you're in a position to prevent any recurrence of this attack. So you consume this in, information, uh, ingest them into your SIM, your other security devices as needed. But due to a defective device feed, one of the correlation rules that you set up in the wake of this incident fails. It fails to detect a reoccurrence of the same uh, attack. Um, uh, and you're exposed, but you're blind to it. You have no way to know. Four months later, a system administrator notices what appears to be a familiar looking exfiltration directory uh, on a server. Investigation shows that 100 gigabytes of tar files were exfiltrated uh, over the preceding months. Um, and, and this information included personal information for 100,000 people. Um, you have to go through a public notification, right? So now the whole world knows that this happened. You have to issue a statement on the breach, which usually includes some level of suggestion about how it happened and what, what occurred. Um, somebody out there on the internet um, uh, connects the dots and realizes, oh, wait a minute, the indicators necessary to detect and prevent this breach actually shared via your ISAL four months earlier. Now, even if they don't know that you were the one who shared it, because you can presumably obscure your identity, although I question that as well, how well you can do that in an information sharing context. But even if you're able to, you still have to explain how you, know, you were aware of this information or your ISAL had, had notified you about these indicators four months prior. And if you're asked about it, um, you know, again, you can't lie. Uh, it's pretty easy for a regulator to determine that, yeah, actually, it was you that shared that you had the exact same uh, uh, incident uh, four months prior, um, and you failed to take appropriate action. How many in this room would like to be in that situation, having to explain how this happened? Uh, I hope nobody. Um, so it, it, it's a bad situation none of us want to be in. And, and it all, it, it, I, and hopefully, you're understanding that. Um, information sharing and the way you go about sharing information 
could actually exacerbate a situation. Now, am I saying, if you rewind, that they never should have shared those indicators with their ISAL? How many people think that they should just shouldn't have shared those indicators? Yeah, I don't think that. I, I think they, that the, it was the right thing to do. If you're participating in one of these things, then yeah, that's a situation where you should share. What they needed to do is make sure that their own mitigation was effective, right? So if you're going to share, make sure that you are in a position to, to in a, especially in a situation where you're sharing information, you've got to make sure that you're effective in your response. So how else can, can sharing information make you less secure? Um, you know, you, you all are more familiar with, with these issues than I am. You know, limited resources to invest in security. And there can be wasted time chasing false alarms. There's a lot of false alarms that come in through these information sharing channels. Um, you know, either things that, that, will, that would never have materialized for you, and there's no way to really know that one way or the other, um, or just things that turn out to be inaccurate. You know, and the more, sh as, as the volume and velocity of sharing increases, which it is certain to do, that problem is going to get worse, not better, in, in my opinion. Um, and that signal to noise ratio uh, over time, the deteriorating, I guess, noise to signal ratio, uh, can lead to erosion of trust in these, in these, uh, uh, in these threat intel sources. So the takeaways here, I'm not saying don't share, um, but you've really got to proceed with caution. Make sure that you have a mature program, particularly to make use of the information that you're consuming uh, before you start to share. Don't give in to, to, to peer pressure or this you know, sort of compulsion to validate everything that you're thinking with a peer that's outside your organization. That can be risky. Try to find someone inside your organization you can talk to about this stuff. Um, and then you know, do what you do best, which is assume and evaluate the worst possible outcome. Right, and prepare for it, and, and I call this, you know, practicing your congressional testimony. If every, if, if, I'm guessing that a lot of you do tabletop exercises. If you don't, you really should do tabletop exercises on a regular basis. Include that as part of it. You know, a, a, a mock deposition of you explaining um, some of these difficult challenges. It is a sobering exercise to go through. All right, I'm out of time here, but thanks everybody.